Good morning, listeners, uh, and happy holidays to everyone. We are here on this beautiful Saturday morning, coming from you at three different locations, St. Louis City, St. Louis County, and I, I presume Chicago, Illinois. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, we, we have a very interesting uh, topic for the few moments we're going to be with you this morning. We're going to deal with this whole notion of displacement and and the historical context of it and we are not going to um, waste any of your time because we do understand that we we have some boys um that are up north that are going into the belly of the beast and um fighting those evil people up north that's the ohio state buckeyes let's go buckeyes uh <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and um, we will um get right into the topic Dr. Alexander, if you will. Yes, 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 yes. So, um, I've I've been working on uh, this. It's not a new concept. This this concept historical trauma that exists. Uh, most times, when people think about historical trauma, they they are either having a kind a conversation about the history of. Um, you know, Hebrews and Jews, uh, or they're having conversations about the Native Americans. It's, it's rare that if we, that we hear the con you know, the, the concept of historical trauma that it is this being applied to the plight of, of Africans and Africans in the diaspora. And so for a couple of years now, I've kind of been in that space. I actually have an article that was a chapter, I wrote a chapter for an edited book on trauma that's at press right now. Uh, and, and, and much of my thought about what we're discussing today kind of starts with some of the research that I was doing um, to, to complete that chapter. And so what I did was I created a timeline that runs from 3000 BC through the, uh, the 67 war, um, Arab, Arab and Israel war, because right now we have a very pressing issue uh, in terms of what's going on in Palestine. And what we see in Palestine and the words that we're hearing in, in Palestine, uh, I think we just wanna make sure people know what, what we're looking at, what we're seeing and, and what we're hearing. And so, um, so we know Palestine's occupied territory, right? So who's occupying? Israel is occupying Palestine, right? And so uh, one thing that we have to know that the occupant is in control of everything. And that's not the narrative that we're getting in terms of what's going on in Palestine. Um, so the, the occupant is literally in control of everything. And, you know, the, the, ter the people who are in the occupied space, the Palestinians have a right to rebel. Because this is an aggressive, this is aggressive move, right? So what we get off the bat when we're having this narrative is that Israel has the right to protect itself. Israel is the aggressor. <laughs> is this, that's, that's not, that's, that's just a political fact. That's what it means to be the occupying force, to be the occupant. Israel is the aggressor. The Palestinians have a right to protect themselves because they're being aggressed. The baseline, all right? So, so we need people to understand that. Next thing we need people to understand is uh, refugees and displaced persons. The folks that they are talking about in Palestine, who are in Palestine, the Palestinians who remain in Palestine, they're not refugees, they're displaced persons. And they're being forced to move south. So you have a force migration of displaced persons to the South. <clears throat> Refugees are folks who cross international boundaries. 
So there are millions of Palestinians who, since the creation of Israel, have been forced out of Palestine and now live in Jordan, live in, you know, some probably live in Egypt and some live in Lebanon. Those are refugees and they're not being allowed to come back. And they're refugees because they cross foreign borders, right? So in my thought, I thought it was important. We have to understand those political terms. And then we also have to understand that this current situation that we're seeing is not a thousand year situation. This is a 70 year situation, maybe hundred year situation. That's, that's what this is. This, is. this is a decision made by some folks, some European Jews that you know, they had a right to Israel as their homeland. Okay, so another conversation for another time, but I thought it was necessary in order for us to kind of understand this whole thing us being black folks to let's put all of this in a historical context, um, which starts with the people, the, the, the populi, pop, populating and the peopling of those spaces. And so if we go back to, you know, to, to the first Egyptian dynasty, you know, that's gonna put us in, you know, the 3000 space, 3000 BC. Uh, and we start to, you know, build a timeline coming forward. One of the things that we will learn about what we now call Pal Palestine in the Middle East, that at the time of Abraham, at best that space was an Egyptian protectorate. And so, <clears throat> All of that space, you know, it, it can be argued if, if, if we got we have a right to that space, you know. So, and I'm not saying we absolutely have a right to that space. I'm just saying we have a right to that space. So, if the if if the people that we call the Palestinians have a right to that space, if the, if the Hebrews slash Jews have a right to that space, then Africans have a right to that space too, you know, um, because that's what the historical record says, right? And so we were there and what started to happen and what happened to our high cultures, and this, this is another very important piece when we start to look at our historical trauma I am in agreement with Dr. Ben, Yosef Ben Yakinen, who says that the, that the rush for Africa started in 1675 or 1680 BC. And he uses that date because that's when the Hyksoks invaded um, Lower Egypt. And that was the first of many assaults that saw us being pushed from, you know, saw, saw us being pushed from the, you know, as far north as the Middle East, as far northeast as the Middle East, you know, back into Upper Egypt. So it starts with the high soaks. And over thousands of years, we had, you know, we had the high soaks, we had the, uh, we had the Assyrians, we had, and so we, we had Hyksos in, like I said, 16, 1675, 1680 BC. Um, we had the Assyrians in 671 BC, the Persians in 523 BC, the Macedonians in 332 BC. When we talk about the Macedonians, you're talking about Alexander the Great. Um, then comes a Roman province in 30 BC. And uh, then the Arabs, the Arabs in 642 AD, and that's who runs, that's, that's who runs uh, much of the Middle East, and 
that's who currently occupies much of, of Northeast Africa and, and you know, Libya and, and Egypt in particular. And so what happened to the ancient comedic people? What happened to the ancient Egyptian people? Forced migration. Right, and so uh, I don't think we could use refugee, you know, in those times because you know we didn't have these kind of artificial fixed boundaries as uh, in in those times that we have now. But we can use force, force migration, and displacement to describe what occurred. And so, so what actually occurred was. We had this, you know, series of conflicts with folks from, again, from from Asia and the Mediterranean and elsewhere in, in, in Europe into Lower Egypt, and um, at some points Upper Egypt, which forced us back into the interior, and so. Um, and for context, in the interior, that we were met similarly to some of the ways um, the United States is dealing with this border um, in terms of um, uh, being very unwanting of those individuals um, out and out protesting them. If if if, if that is is that a decent context, Doc? That's a, that's a decent context. Also, another, you know, context that, that we need to look at it is the native population to the U.S. When Europeans came here, you know, these groups that we think that we now call the, you know, the Plains Indians and all that kind of stuff, these groups lived up and down the, the eastern uh, seaboard and some of them lived on the Gulf and pressure and displacement <laughs> from those places into the interior. You know, the 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 Creek, the Cherokee, the Sioux, all those those are those are northern indigenous nations that were pushed across the US into Indian territory, right? So Oklahoma and all that kind of stuff, the, uh, you know, what became, so it was the, the uh, Northwest Territory, which became, you know, Ohio and Minnesota and Michigan and Indiana and all that kind of stuff. These groups weren't native to those spaces. They were pushed into those spaces, right? First destiny. So, we were destined, you know, so, so same thing. Oh, yeah. Destiny. So, yeah. Take these. So you areas. have manifest destiny, which is what governed the United States, and what you know, you know, when we kind of fast forward, you know, to kind of what's going on in in Palestine, and we're kind of looking at, you know, chosen people. Da da da. da. So those those concepts kind of correlate in that correlate in that regard. But what I'm encouraging us to contemplate and to consider is that that was happening to us. And so when we look at the biblical narrative and, and we, you know, we, we are clear about the movements of the Hebrews, but we're not really clear about the movement of the continental African, right? And so this, this, this narrative that I'm proposing and, and what I've created is again, this, this timeline, it's 3000 plus year timeline. Right now it's like a 5,000 year timeline and it's a limited document. I got a lot of stuff on it, but it's a lot of stuff I don't have in it that I'm gonna steadily add, but our trauma starts with the forced migration and displacement that was that occurred as a result 
initially of the assaults on the continuous assaults on ancient Kemet, i.e. Uh, Egypt, you know, up to the point of the transatlantic slave trade. So and you mean so, before 1619, we had trauma? We had significant trauma. <laughs> and so um, one of my favorite books, ref re you know, referenced it on here before as uh, The Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. And so one of the things that we do, and we do a very good job of it, but there's some, there's some, you know, can be some adverse implications. And that is, you know, there's a bunch of us who are aware of the African high cultures, right? Um, but if they don't exist anymore, the question has to be, why? <laughs> And what happened? And how did the people respond? Now, if we use Chancellor Williams as, as, a, as you know, kind of as an example, the destruction of Black civilization, that could not have been good. That had to be a traumatic event. Right? Now, when we were looking at when we're looking at what's going on in Palestine and we're watching these people being moved, being told to leave the North and go to the South because they're going to be safe only to get shelled when they're in the South. That's forced migration. That looks traumatic. This is what was happening to the ancient comedic people of forced migration back South. All right, so we were moved out of Egypt, back into what is probably the Sudan now. And you have the rise of other kingdoms. And so you had a rise of Kush, um, 10,070 BC, 350 AD. Um, uh, what else you have? You have Well, it was it's another spot other than Kush that I wanted to talk about, but you also have the rise of Ghana. And so Ghana, that, as we know it today on the West Coast, that is named after the ancient kingdom of Ghana. And so the ancient kingdom of Ghana was in that area, you know, that we probably call the Sudan. And so it was one of the entities that arose as a result of the pressure, again, from the Mediterranean and, and, and um, Western Asia on Egypt, pushing us back into, pushing us back into uh, the interior. And then you had coming direct from our direct east, you know, continue onslaught of pressure from Arabs. And so the Arabs come in and they start to engage with, with Ghana. And what we then see is like three successive nations, you know, over the course of you know thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. And you have you have the rise and fall of Ghana, you have the rise and fall of Mali, and you have the rise and fall of the Songhai Empire. But as this is occurring, because of this pressure from the East, more displacement, and we're being pushed from the Sudan across the Sahara on, onto the West Coast. So by the time we have the rise and fall of the Songhai Empire, we're on the West Coast of Africa. Okay. Okay. If, if, I, I, let, let me, um, if, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. um, add some, some biblical context to what you've just stated. Yes, um, sir. Then we can bring, we certainly, um, Gerald, we're dealing with the exact same displacement um, now currently in St. Louis City and, 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 and um, Black areas um, throughout the United States. 
that you know creating similar trauma that that doc is is speaking of um but if uh I go to genesis 10 it lines up exactly with what you're talking about dr alexander um and i'm going to read this uh, listeners please bear with me this is the first time i think i've read a an entire chapter um, but i don't think i'll need to read the entire chapter of the bible but i think this is important for context because one of the issues you you bring up when you talk about the Hebrews being um, being displaced, we need to define Hebrew um, because I think the um, that that umbrella certainly is larger than what it has been described to be uh, in the past historically, uh, particularly since the Zionist period. Um, I think it's been significantly lowered during the Zionist period. But I'm reading from. Genesis 10, uh, and it states that this is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. The Yasephites, the sons of Japheth, were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and, and Tyrus, the sons of Gomer. Pay attention. Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togamah, the sons of Javan, Elijah, Tarnish, the Ketites, and the Rodonites. From these, the maritime people spread out into their territories by their clans within the nations, each with its own language. The Hamites were the sons of Ham, which were Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Saba, Havilah, Sapta, Rama and Septaka, the sons of Rama, Sheba and Dedan. Cush was the father of Nimrod who became a mighty warrior on the earth. Uh, many of you all understand the, the Babel. Um, you, would know, you would remember Nimrod and Nimrod is, is the individual where we get the cross from um, as, as a symbol. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, and Kalanit, and in Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Kala, and Rezin, which is in between Nevena and Kala, which is the great city. Egypt was the father of the Ludites, the Anamites, the Leobites, the Nephthites, the Parathusites, the Kaslushites, um, from whom the, the Philistines came, and the Kaphratorites. Canaan was the father of Sidon, the firstborn, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, Amorites, the Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvidites, Zemorites, and Hamathites. Later, the Canaanites clan scattered and the <clears throat> and the borders of Canaan reached from Sidon towards Gerar as far as Gaza and then towards Sodom and Gomorrah, Adama, Adma and Zebulun as far as Lish Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans and the language in their territories and nations. Finally, the Semites where the sons were also born to Shem whose older brother was Japheth. People conflate those two wrongly. Shem was the ancestors of all the sons of Eber. The sons of Shem were, the, were Elam, Asher, Aphrodax, Axphazad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hu, Hul, Gather, and Meshach. Arafak was the father of Shelah, and Shelah the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg, because of the time the earth was divided, his brother was named Jokat. Jokat, uh, Jokatan, sorry. Jokatan was the father of Almadad, Shelef, Hazramavath, Jera, Hadaram, Yuzel, Dikla, Obel, Abimel, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Joab, and Jobab. All these were sons of Jokatan. The regions where they lived stretched from Mesha towards Sephir in the eastern hill. These are the sons of Shem by their clans and, and languages and their territories and nations. 
So, I mean, you know, that lines up, of course, you, we could spend a year breaking that down, but that lines up primarily with your description, Doc. So you have, you have these movements, you know, other things I think that we have to contemplate also is uh, changing climatic conditions. And so like we talk now about global warming and all of that, but you know, archae um, geologists and archeologists are all pretty much of the same note that um, like the Sahara Desert is expanding. You know, there was fertile ground in, in, in these spaces at one point and now that is less the case. And so there are some folks who were moving because they were moving, they were forced by um, climatic reasons to have to move, you know, so that's, that's it's still displacement, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's just not due to some kind of, you know, some kind of aggressive uh, hostile action. But again, so the thing is to understand that we were already, you know, it, it was it was the events prior to um, prior. It was the events prior to the transatlantic slave trade that laid the foundations for uh, for for the transatlantic slave trade. And so, again, we have to consider this constant pressure coming from from the east. And then, you know, from the north and everything kind of in between. And so um, so we have we have the uh, Byzantine period, right? And so that's where we have Emperor uh, Constantine, and we start to have the more let's say the formalization of the institution of Christianity. And, you know, so that's, that really amounts in terms of what's happening in Africa, you know, in North Africa and in the Mediterranean, uh, what we're seeing in that space is more colonization, all right? And so it's in the context of that, you know, that, that time period from, Let's say from the, so the Roman period and and the Byzantine period. That's you know that's solidly New Testament. Okay, and so that's 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 what you're getting in in the New Testament, and um, you know so we, we know that the you know it's the Roman government that has that has control over uh, what we call the Middle East. And what we what we know to be um, Egypt, and you know, really everything that surrounds the uh, Mediterranean. I think so, Daniel, Daniel eleven really does a great job of of um, uh, uh, identifying what you just stated as well. I mean, that's where, it, you know, it says the kings of the south and the north, um, you know, kings will rise in, in Persia and then a fourth will be far richer and so forth. It really describes the Alexander, the great period. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening again, what we have to think about is when these people are coming in, when they're coming in, if you know, again, we, uh, Chancellor Williams, as as you know, as our point of reference, this is all. These are these are various time frames in the course of the destruction of Black civilization. What do we mean? These invading forces, in as much as they're taking over, you know, physical space, they're and they are displacing people, they are necessarily displacing culture, right? That's one of We're the hallmarks of the, that's one of the hallmarks of the Catholic church though, isn't it? They, the, um, actually the Roman Catholics 
um, they would come in and conquer you. They'd implement some of your um, uh, 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 attributes of your culture and and force upon you the vast majority of theirs. Yes, which also is traumatic, right? And so, th and so these are the things that are occurring that we don't, you know, even when we have a, an awareness of these things, when we have a, when we have some understanding of, of the history, we don't, we still don't consider these things as traumatic. So we don't, we don't consider the contacts as traumatic and we don't consider the implications or the results of the contacts to be traumatic. But but do we not consider it traumatic because of the the current trauma that we're under? You know, you don't really get an opportunity to sit back and reflect on this because you are still constantly dealing with the displacement and the destruction of your culture. That is an awesome point, uh, Tony Christmas, because that is kind of essentially what I think is that we... <clears throat> So, cuz when you I, as Trump, I listen to Trump. all of this, go ahead. Hmm. Go ahead. I was just saying as I listen to all of it, you think about rarely do we ever get an opportunity to sit down and just have an analysis of all of this as a people or as a whole or even as a group. Well, I have a as a small that, group. It's so it's it's all so for me it's all trauma related. And as I've said on here many times, when we look at what, you know, kind of some of our faults and some of our shortcomings, it all looks like the trauma response to me, right? Because we do have opportunities to sit and talk and analyze this, but there are parts of this that I think that we intentionally avoid and deny. Like we have, we have like, so so let's again so let's look at this this Roman and Byzantine period this period that is clearly New Testament right many of us can't we we can't process that because we think it's sacrilegious <laughs> so we're not going to deal with the truth the historical facts of what occurred in that period of time because we think we would be questioning the Bible Right? We're not going to deal with the historical facts of whatever we think was occurring during the time of Moses because we think we're questioning the Bible. Right? And so we have these conversations, at least on a weekly basis, about that space and time. We're just not doing the deep dives because we don't really want to deal with the implications of what we might find. That's a good point. So, so that's and especially one part. when you raise up the, the issue about is, questioning the know, Bible. Say that again. I said that's a good point, especially when you bring up the issue about questioning the Bible. Yeah, and then, and then, and then it's the same for folks who practice Islam, right? And so, you know, the 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 Muslim slave trade lasted longer and is probably much more detrimental than the transatlantic slave trade. It could be argued that the Muslim slave trade is still going on now. You know, if we look at what's going on in the Sudan, for example, that's, that's an Islamic issue, right? You know. And to that point also, though, with respect to these trauma responses, I mean, we don't want to go there. Half the time, I mean that that hurts, and, and, and that's and that's and that's what comes with hurts. trauma. You get avoidance. It hurts. It, it, that's it's avoidance. It's a coping mechanism. I had my son pulled me out of it uh, last. My, my uncle died, who was like a big brother to me, uh, and in order to avoid going into that, you know, the the area of having to mourn someone that loved you unconditional. I came up with this veneer of, you know, well, you, yeah, you know, he got stage four cancer because, you know, well, you know, it's kind of predictable if you smoke. And I, my son, you know, and I said this in his eulogy. I was, you know, my aunt asked me to do his eulogy. Uh, you know, my son said, yeah, but he loves you. Um, and, you know, broke away all of that foolishness because we have become so indoctrinated into protecting a criminal enterprise, this colony, 
and and um and standing on this rugged individualism foolishness that we have and it helps us protect ourselves when we see these trauma these traumatic things happening in mass and, you know it's a way for us not to say that okay that couldn't happen to me because but in fact it could happen to you and you should in be in fact it does it, happen. <laughs> it, it 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 does happen because so so ultimately, as I feel in this timeline, it's going to create, the, the, the timeline is going to create the context for people to kind of do what clinically we call it dynamic sizing, right? And it's like, and that, that means really being able to look at the macro and then bring it to the micro. Wow. Right. And, and so, so and, and the two of you already referenced this. Ultimately, what we're talking about historically and what we're seeing also, you know, currently in terms of what is happening in Palestine, this is what happens to Black folks all over the place. And this is what is happening. This is, you know, we've seen force, we, we've seen displacement in St. Louis, right? Right? When, when we talk about urban renewal, and we talking about the, the the U.S. highway system, you know, and and the fact that we know based on historical record, not not that we necessarily kept, but that the aggressors kept, that we know that they you know we we're gonna we're gonna cut through this neighborhood, <laughs> right, to to build this highway. You know, they the, talk about the displacement of the black community in St. Louis all the time yeah. for the building of the arts yes. and and the, the other the historic arts. black neighborhoods that were in that area that were devastated as a result of that. And uh, since twenty twenty one, we call Clayton. Clayton, much of Clayton was black. You know, displacement. Uh, the that mall over there. On, on Brentwood, all of that mall space, much of that, you know, for-, for Well, you know, Brentwood actually, when you Richmond, think about it, we just we just watched it happen in, in, in our municipality, Larry University City, because we're, what, what, we're the Costco, with the Costco and, and the other uh, structures that have come as a result of that, though, we know that those were black neighborhoods. We, we have friends that lived in those neighborhoods that uh, went and to family. school with us and so family. All right. this, we know that know, whole area happens under the guise of eminent domain, you know, and things of this nature. But these these, these things have always been happening, right? And so, you know, so again, so if we go back to you know Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. So in that period of time, we see for whatever reasons, and we kind of know what, you know, we know generally those reasons have to do with, you know, a conquering force that, you know, Christianity comes, it, it takes its toll on African culture. Islam comes, it takes its toll on African culture. And people are making decisions about whether to follow you know the you know whether or not they're going to follow Islam or Christianity based on a relative threat. Now, one of the things that when we have when we do have these conversations, we have these conversations as if Islam and Christianity spread because of you know um, the benevolent grace <laughs> of of the folks bringing it. And that's, that's, that's just patently false, you know? And so people were changing either because of physical violence or some kind of economic gain. And so we see that very clearly with, um, with Islam that on the front end, you know, leadership of Ghana, leadership of Mali, they made decisions to start to practice Islam because A, it would help to protect you know, their, their Eastern flank, but also because it also, it, it allowed for 
them to stay engaged, you know, in commerce, right? But it's not really a lot different than what happened. So, like in the so, like the the uh, Europe. <laughs> Yeah, so when we start to get that pressure there from the north, right, we get, uh, and, and the Portuguese, the Portuguese are bringing, you know, they come in with, they, they come in with their missionaries and the missionaries lay the foundation and then the missionaries are followed by soldiers. In my end, say those- When you look at your, Dr. Alexander, when you look at your timeline, as far back as you gone in that timeline, which is some great work, Incredible. And when you look at where we are now, where do you see? What's what? What do you see based on that? We're gonna move to next. When you look at the situation we're dealing with and the U.S. involvement with um, Russia and Ukraine, and then also our uh, dealings with. Um, Israel and the Palestinians. And then when you think about also Israel and the Palestinians, you think about the support that we provide to the Israeli government. And then also you think about the support I do that we provide to the Palestinians in the U.S. Because for us in our community, when I say us, I'm talking about in the black community, it is the Palestinians, the Arabs that are heavily in our community running in particular, um, the convenience store business, the, the gas stations, the convenience stores, those are all Arabs in our community. It appears to me, and I don't have a direct evidence, but it appears to me that they receive some type of subsidy from the government funds in order to operate the way that they do in our communities. Um, what What's the future? What where, where are we moving towards next based on that timeline? So can I, can I just say this real quick to the listeners? The question that is just posed is the reason why history is important. History tells you how you got to where you are. It's not a museum. Go ahead, Doc. And so, and, and, and great question, Joe, because that, again, that's, uh, I, I think the timelines are important because they show us sequentially how we got here, and I, and as it as I continue to build it out, and, that, and we continue to revisit, is to have people start to get engaged in what's called pattern recognition, so that you're able to look at these things and say, oh, this is the same thing that happened, blah 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 blah, right? And so for like quick example of that, and this kind of gets to where we are now. <clears throat> we. Just like I said about, you know, so we, we'll talk about when we when we try to conceptualize our now, we'll say we built the we built the pyramids and they didn't bring slaves over here. They brought doctors and lawyers and chemists over here. Well, if that's true, what happened? <laughs> right. So. <laughs> so yeah, that's true. What happened? <laughs> so, so, so how did that? How how did that happen? So we have to deal with the how that happened. So to your question, these things are happening all day, every day. We're struggling with our ability to really kind of conceptualize what's, a, what's occurring for the reasons that you stated in your earlier question, uh, question Attorney Christmas. And that is that we are under such pressure all the time. All the time. It's, it's just very difficult for us to really look at that, look at what's going on and understand. It. We we see it, but we don't necessarily, I, I was having a conversation with one of my mentors last night and he was like, we don't have the ego strength to be able to tolerate the truth, which just means that it's really re-traumatized for us to deal with, you know, the historical facts. If he just it's better, it's better for us to deal in fantasy than in reality. That's that's our maladaptive <laughs> response. Our maladaptive right. response is a flight, right? So, <laughs> and so, great, great example, you know, kind of 
<laughs> within the context again of, of, of you know of the Roman and Byzantine period in, in the life of Jesus. Jesus is a revolutionary, right? Jesus, Jesus is living in occupied territory, right? By the Roman government, right? Jesus is not saying, well, I ain't about to deal with none of this because I know who sits on the throne. That's, that's not what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus actively engaged the space to try to make sure what? That the last will be first and the first shall be last, right? And, you know, and that you know, the least of these got what, what, what they want. But that's not what we have going on now. We have folks saying that you calling Jesus' name to be passive you know, in the midst of this constant onslaught. And so- I thought about that as soon as you said say, it. Hmm, say that again? I just thought about that as soon as you said Jesus being a revolutionary and I just, it, it hit me right off that very seldom do you even hear that anymore. There was a time when you did hear that, but mm -hmm. I can't remember the last time that Jesus was characterized as a revolutionary. Great book for people to read. Uh, uh, called Jesus and the Disinherited by Howard Thurman. Uh, very, very good deep dive into you know what what the what the life of Christ you know you know was and is, and um, and is done so in the context of him being a second class citizen living in occupied you know Palestine. <laughs> That's Did you ever do the audio books? I love audio books. I love okay. Audio. Yeah. I think that's what I'm going to start doing the audio books. I feel like I'm cheating, though, if I do the audio books. No, you're not cheating. And it, it allows you to okay. move and get done other things. You ain't really got to stop a whole lot of stuff. You can keep mm -hmm. kind of doing what you're doing and do your audio books, particularly. I mean, for me, I do it while I'm doing my walks so, and, and I do it while I'm driving. So it's, it's a great, great thing. And, I, and, and what I found... I enjoy even more is to do an audio book after I've read a book. Okay. I read a book and then I get then I do that that same book on the audio. Oh man, it's just so much more rich. So it's pretty great. But that's the that's a great book. Um uh it's another book I'll think of before we get off here, I think. Um but so because you got to make we, a list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we 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 kind of struggle because it is traumatic. And so we say these things, but we don't necessarily deal with the implications. So if we talk about I get I give you another example of like distancing. And and I think we referenced this more recently too, but like, when's the last time somebody from St. Louis said to you, man, the St. Louis, the East St. Louis massacre was terrible? What they're more likely to say to you is they blew up Black Wall Street in Tulsa. Right. right. Well, Gerald and I talked about the East St. Louis massacre this morning. Right. And, and, but, and that's fine, but most people don't. Most yep. people are but going you're to right. go to, to Tulsa. Most people are going to talk about Tulsa right. as opposed to East St. Louis. Right, right. It's the proximity. Right. Right, but then a lot of that about, too has, not has to do St. Louis, and they're not going to talk about, and they're not going to talk about uh, Springfield, Illinois. They're not going to talk about Springfield, Missouri. They're not going to talk about right. Joplin, Missouri. They're not going to talk about Pierce right. City, Missouri. Now, and what do we have in all of those places? Aggression and forced displacement. Right. So much do they go to our educational system, though, in the way that we. When I talk about we as uh, uh, African people in this country are being educated, we are not being educated on our history, and that's our and fault. our children we're, really. We're not it is our fault for that either. And and we have not been able to come up with a mechanism or a way. We need a curriculum that I guess we can impose at home and in our institutions so because it's not going to happen. You know, our educational institutions, they don't want to go there. Even, you know, when they're black led 
our educational institutions don't want to go there. Then you know they don't. Even when we have a, a you know a overwhelming majority black district, when I say overwhelming, I'm like 80, 90 percent, they still will not want to teach them about who they are. And so there's plenty, plenty, plenty of curriculums. Um, one, you know, one like real easy thing is you can go to, uh, to uh, Howard Zinn. He has, you know, there's a just a tremendous amount of information there. Um, uh, Equal Justice Initiative, tremendous amount of information there. And these are online, you know, online resources that are that are free. Um, you can go to the Carter G. Wilson's um, site. Um, what is it? The association. I forget the name of his organization, but the uh, association. That I don't know if it's the study of African American, African history or something like that. But uh, but that's Carter G. Wilson's site. I just can't remember the name you know, the actual name of it. But if you Google Carter G. Whitson, you know, the association will come up. But mm -hmm. there's all there are all sorts of free resources, um, you know, broken up into teaching plans and workbooks and the whole nine. We just have to be willing to engage it, right? And so, we we still we 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 are in the midst of you know like literally living and breathing our historical trauma. So I don't really subscribe to thoughts of like like I don't believe in uh, post traumatic trauma. I mean post traumatic slave trauma. I don't I don't believe in that construct. I don't disagree with with the sisters' work. I, I disagree with. The definition, the type, yeah, where, yeah. What do you mean? You disagree um, what? With with so, post traumatic slave syndrome, it's an incredible. No, I heard book. him say that. What part of it? What part of it? Okay, so, so, so when did when did that trauma start? When did it start? Oh. And when did it stop? And and when did it stop? <laughs> so when did it start? And when did it stop? And so that's that's that is so, a fair. It's not even a critique. It's a fair defining of it. Yeah, you can even call it a critique. What you're stating is a, a, a fair yeah. extension of it. Yeah, so I just, I just don't like the title. I understand. And, so, and, and the title gets to be problematic, particularly you know, for those who actually want to have a conversation. It's very easy to get sidetracked by the enemy because the enemy is going to start talking to you about, you know, so well, it's going to say the same thing. It's going to like, well, so when did it start and stop? <laughs> and then you get baffled with that because then you can't, it does not adequately address whatever occurs from emancipation forward. And, you know, again, she, you know, she tries to address that in her writings, but it doesn't work for the title. You, you, right? you know, because so what? Because when you say post, that suggests that this is subsequent to whatever the trauma was. That's what that means. So it can't then read forward. So those things that occurred after emancipation cannot fall under the same rubric. If that makes sense to you, turn yeah. because because you said it's, it's it's post it's it's post slavery syndrome. Okay, so so when does that when when does that end? When does that stop? So what if it, what if what if your ancestors aren't that? What if what if you one of the folks who you know your folks been free forever? What if what? So how do we con how do we conceptualize your trauma? Don't nobody look at you and be like, oh, you you descend from free Negroes. You don't you don't descend from enslaved Negroes. We're gonna treat you different. That's not how this works. 
But and have so, any of us, is that possible though? Have any of us descended from, none of us could have descended from free. That's not true. Uh, they, were, they were free, they were free uh, Africans here in 1619. Yes, it was free folks here before these people got here. Um, and so, so. But you but, still got treated the same way, even if, you know, people wouldn't know. Point. That's my point. They wouldn't know. They wouldn't know that, that you descended from. They they gonna look but at you automatically. That's part of the assume. of the title. Uh huh. And so, so what what can't be argued and disputed is the treatment, right? So right. all I'm saying is is that we, you know, so I like the term. I like historical trauma. I like complex trauma. Uh, I came. Mm -hmm. up, I, I saw something. I was doing some reading. Uh, because I mean. Like the post thing, it's 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 a problem. Period. It's not just a problem for us. It's it's a problem. Period. Um, so there there are other writings that kind of speak to that, and not 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 even just in relationship to her and her definition, uh, but even the the use of it when folks are talking about post traumatic um, trauma, PTSD, that it it poses the issue because of the mm -hmm. implications of, of the definition. And so, so we are in a space where we are like literally treading water because there's complex trauma, trauma after trauma after trauma after trauma, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, some of us, so, so like when we talk about fight or flight, there's another response, freeze. So there's fight. Flight or free. So like when we hear deer in headlights, that's freeze. Right. So you either fight the power, you can run, or you can be just so totally overwhelmed that you freeze. Oh, so do we uh, actually need more and, guys? And all I three of those deal with mistakes. Trauma. They all and do we actually need more say, guidance uh, on how to deal with this trauma? Say that again. Do we actually need more guidance on how to deal yeah, with this trauma? So is that is that one it, is that one of our big issues? Is that we don't yeah. know how to deal with trauma? So, so part of it is part of it is acknowledging the trauma. Come on now, come on and now. Then, and then once we acknowledge the trauma, then then we have to figure out like you know we can certainly see things on on you know kind of a aggregate basis like. What 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 things look like, but we people individually have to kind of do the deep dives and kind of see and understand. Like it can't just be happenstance that we have disproportionately high um, diabetes and high blood pressure, right? All of that ain't because of food deserts. Some of that, a large part of that, is. Social stress, stress. stress. And, and so stress. because we are always literally under the gun, our our nervous system is responding as though we are under threat. And so when your nervous system responds as if you're under threat, what happens? Your blood pressure goes up. Why? Because mm -hmm. it's got to get it's got to get blood oxygenated blood to your extremities. So that you could either fight <laughs> or flee, right? Right. And so, and if you stay in that state, so that's 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 a, that's an adaptive process to start with. But that's really only supposed to last like fifteen minutes. Yeah, but we live like that. We but live we like live that. like that, and so you right. live in a state where your body is is like is preparing for the worst, and so that becomes a way of living. All right, so. So, so how does that relate to high blood pressure and diabetes? Okay, so we, we say what, how it relates to high blood pressure is that your body has to ramp up because it either has to fight or flee. Well, then how does that relate to diabetes, Dr. Alexander? Well, your body needs energy in order to ramp up and to sustain itself long enough to manage the threat. So how does it get that energy? It creates sugars. And so... In theory, there is actually a real threat and your body produces enough of that sugar in order to help you to manage that threat. And then it, it all happens in one fell swoop. You get alerted, your body produces that energy that it needs to, to, uh, to avert the threat. 
and then it burns that energy and then eventually you go you relax that's that's what's supposed to happen but if you're stuck in that space your body keeps producing sugar right and then that sugar that doesn't get burned turns to fat you know the 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 you know, so that's, that's the like... short that's the that's the that's the annotated <laughs> yeah. you know, well, story I mean, I... on that. but so these are things that 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 happen you know these you know so our bodies get compromised because of the amount of stress that we live under because it causes our adaptive systems to run a file. So the other thing is that your body's running, cycling at that high level, you get exhausted, right? You get tired, starts to cut the, you know, your body's, your body's producing, you know, these, these hormones, these stress hormones, cortisol and, um, and adrenaline and all that kind of stuff. That's wearing out your bowels, you know, because your body is working harder because it's trying, your body is trying to keep you safe, but it's working harder and it's not turning off because you feel that amount of threat, constant, right? And so all of these things, they impact, they impact our everyday. And so, you know, then you add to it those other things, then you add food desert, then you add pay disparity, then you add, you know, mm -hmm. you start adding all of those those other things. You police know, brutality you know, and everything. Police yeah. brutality, you know, you add all of these other things and, and you see that that's, that's, that's kind of what we're looking at and that's how your body is responding and that's how we end up physically sick and, and, and emotionally sick and mentally sick, all, all of that, all of those things together. But it kind of, to your question, how do we get through this is that we, we, we have to look more critically at the historical piece, be able to chart our progression. <clears throat> we have to learn that, you know, our, our um, you know, our pride in whatever the best of it was is fine, but it has to be tempered by, the, by, you know, the subsequent events, right? And so if we were great, what happened? And why is it that we can't, you know, why is it that we either can't recreate it or why is it that we can't protect what we have? Why are we still vulnerable? So again, you know, the, the 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 easy answer is okay, there is white supremacy. So we know that. But how is it that we don't have, and that's not just that's that's everywhere. We we don't we, we ain't put up the firewalls. We we know what this looks like. At least we should. Enough of us do. So how do we put up the firewalls? That's kind of where we are is trying to figure that part out like well so, you know it's hard for us to figure out how to put up the firewalls because we are too busy trying to assimilate and it, so, you know when you try to try to assimilate it when you try to assimilate you don't have firewalls on your agenda so there's a great deal of confusion right because it's confusion remember exactly Right, because some folks are, you know, some folks have assimilated, some folks are assimilating, you know. So, like, what does this stuff mean, right? So, all of that, all of that, all of that comes with, you know, with its relative burden, you know. And so, we have to continue to do the work to to define what is, you know. Um, but again, we this there's the, the threat is going to be. I mean, when we look at Palestine, we we many of us aren't saying to ourselves that we live in occupied territory now. Like many of us don't recognize that every US city has a perimeter. So in Chicago, we got 294. In St. Louis, you got 270. In Atlanta, you got uh what is it? Two, what is it? 285 in Atlanta? 285. Right. 285. 
Now, in Atlanta, they call it exactly what it is. It's the perimeter. Perimeter mall. Right. <laughs> and so, right, right out there by perimeter mall. And so, so in Atlanta, they call it the perimeter mall. Where do the majority of black folks live? Inside the perimeter. That's right. If something were to go down, all they got to do is shut down the perimeter. Nothing gets in or nothing gets out. That's Palestine. In St. Louis, all they got to do is shut down 270 and 155. Nothing gets in or out of St. Louis or East St. Louis. Right? Now, those of us who live outside the perimeter, you know, so like in Chicago, it's 294. And so you got 294, and then you got the then you got the uh, you got the you got the lake, right? So you the majority of black population lives inside 294. So if they shut it down, nothing gets in, nothing gets out. Those of us who live outside of the perimeter, we live in the West Bank. We actually live in Israel, still, you know, still under this external threat. So we don't we don't even we don't process it. This we don't process it like. But that is, in fact, the case. This entire notion of displacement is occurring in droves in the United States, and we are not processing it. St. Louis City, in it, on its own, since 2021, has lost 56,000 Black families. So St. Louis when City, the only place that has more displacements of Black folks in the United States is L.A. And so like here, you know, so when they went down and they knocked down uh, the projects, the housing developments, you know, on the State Street Corridor, where did those people go? Right? Now, some of them, some of them, you know, just moved further south. Um, some of them left the state, you know. Um, they, you know, some of them went to Indiana. You know, so but that's displacement, right? And so and 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 we need to, you know, when we say displacement, I think we need to have right behind it the the traumatic experience associated with displacement. Well, that's the thing again, that's is that it, we yep. so even when we see these things occurring, we don't we're not processing the trauma. Again, that's what I'm saying. We can talk about high cultures. But we don't then talk about what happened that resulted in translated slave trade, right? And so, <clears throat> like, we 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 don't process we don't process the entire narrative, and so that is an avoidant response. I think that is indicative of our trauma, and that. These, these things that are overwhelming, um, we, we avoid. Now, that is an adaptive process at a level because, you know, again, that's, that's the mind's attempt to hold it together for you to be okay. But that's supposed to be like a short, that's a short term response to an immediate threat, right? It's, it's trying to get you to hold it together so that you can you know, get to where you got to get to so you can get safe again. Once you get to safety, you're supposed to look at and reevaluate the previous threat so that the next time that you can, or next time you are confronted by that threat, you have a reasonable response. And that's not, the, we're not, we're not getting to that part. Well, we can't get to it, but we, we haven't gotten to it because the trauma comes in so many different forms, just like you stated. Um, you know, earlier when you talked about uh, the the you know the the mainstay of our being is traumatic. Then we've got to deal with the pay disparities. Then we've got to deal with you know with the housing issues, the food deserts, so forth and so on. Which you know, in in, the, in, in your example, um, led to diabetes. Um, uh, so, I mean, if you could, uh, as we wrap this up, Doc, and look forward to continue this conversation in, in, in um, coming weeks, give uh, the audience some coping mechanisms to deal with this and to help all of us uh, work through these experiences. Again, most fundamental, most fundamental 
relaxation uh, technique. And people, you know, people people really think this is condescending and it's not. And it's, it's how you reset your system. Deep breathing. We gotta sit down, get in correct posture, meaning, you know, sitting straight up, shoulders back, and take deep breaths. Call it diaphragmatic breathing, you know. So breathe in your diaphragm. So like the diaphragm is like right above your, your stomach. So instead of breathing, you know, so that your chest is moving, you know, you're, you're inflating your, your lungs and your chest is out, breathe so that, you know, literally your belly is out. Your stomach right? inflates. Yes. And then and, and have that, that come up through your chest and out. Have that come up, right? Do that three or four shout times. Out, shout out to Alonzo, yeah. my yoga instructor. He has a star class like that. Yes. And and what that does is tell that tells your that signals to your system that we're good. That tells your system that there is no relative threat. Because if there was a relative threat, you'd be <sighs> You know what I'm saying? You'll be breathing heavy and hard because you're trying to you're trying to get that oxygen in, trying to get that air in. And so that you, you know, your your and your um and your heart is pumping harder to get the, the oxygenated blood to where it's gotta go. But once you take control of your breathing and you do those deep inhalations and, and you exhale, now you're being very intentional about your breathing. That's signaling to to the mind that oh we're okay because you are literally controlling that situation and and that's what we have to do just at various times throughout the day we just gotta you know take a break a couple of minutes you know get your get your feet flat you know you can put your hands on your thighs you know or you can put your hands in your lap sit back. Hold your head straight and just breathe. Earlier, you, know? you talked about being able to identify the threat and acknowledging that it is a threat. I, and I mm -hmm. don't want to uh, come up with any colloquialisms, um, but I have heard other people, you know, your colleagues state that being able to um, identify the threat or, or name it, if you can name it, you can tame it. So in other words, if you can name the fact that I'm stressed out right now, you can then begin to address it. Yeah, because then you can kind of prioritize. Like some people, like some people who experience anxiety, right? A lot of times they're anxious about what could be. It doesn't actually exist. They're just anxious about what could be. So a lot of times, you know, I tell folks that I work with who are experiencing anxiety, I tell them, to do what we just did, you know, do that breathing piece. And um, after that first round of breathing, you know, kind of look around and, you know, is there anything in your immediate environment that is a risk, that is a threat to you? No. Do some more breathing. So if there's nothing around you that's a threat to you, what is it that you are responding to? And so then they have to start to think about it. Right. Um, and it might be that they realize that there's really nothing that's posing an immediate threat to me. And, you know, whatever is a burden, I could probably figure out how to address it. Um, but right now, I am actually relatively safe. Breathe some more. And once you get to that point, you know, you can then start, you know, calming yourself down. You can then start to kind of prioritize. Are there things that I really need to get, to, you know, that I really need to address? Okay, yeah, okay. So of those things that I need to address, and I encourage people to start with, you know, easy things, you know, literally easy things, because we need to, we got to build up, you know, some confidence, right? So if we can get some easy wins on the board, we need that. You know, so things that we can that you know that we could we could change, you know, with minimal effort, let's say. And then you just you have to literally start to you know do your problem solving and all of that. 
And so what, what can come with all of that, with the breathing, with the, you know, kind of with the room scans and then the larger kind of, you know, you know, ideational scans, like what's going on around me and all that kind of stuff. You really kind of get yourself into the practice of mindfulness, right? And so we hear about that too all the time as an as a intervention. And I think people get scared, but really all it is is being present in the moment. That's what it means. And so, and so once you start to engage in this very intentional thought about whatever it is, you know, or the intentional behavior, that has a way of, you know, of, of relaxing you as well. Um, because again, it's, it's telling your body that I got this, I'm in control of this moment. And that's, that's kind of what we need. And so if we can, that, that, that would literally be level set. That's level set. You know, that's, that's what that is. And that's what we have to be able to do. And that is the intent by why we do what we do on Saturday mornings is so that people can level set. This is a way that you level set in that, you know, in that emotional, that mental and emotional space. Yes. Wow. I don't think that uh, we could have written a better summary had we um, had it edited a hundred times. Um, so just to summarize, we, we uh, the show, you went back um, to, uh, you know, in history so we can realize where we are and deal with that. Then, you know, um, went back to identify the fact that we're, you know, some of these, uh, a number of these things are traumatic and, and we need to at least understand where we are in dealing with the trauma. We're either going to deal with it, we're going to fight, flight, or freeze. Um, uh, um, and we gave everyone coping mechanisms on how to deal with it effectively. The first one is deep breathing. Second one was naming it. And most importantly, and this gets me every time, is being mindful and staying in the moment. You cannot accomplish very much being before or after where you are. Uh, and and that, 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 that is prevalent in life. That is prevalent in sports. Worst thing in the world I can do is, uh, is, to, is, is to pull up on the seventh uh, tee box and think about the shot that I got to hit on number nine. I can guarantee you I will not be successful. And that happens in life and it happens in sport as well. So uh, Dr. Alexander, yes. I could not thank you more. And, and I got, so, so we said, uh, so of course we talked about what I said is my favorite book, um, uh, Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. Um, but the other, the, the books in the, in the Christian space that I think people need to read, that we need to read because they will help us to kind of recenter our conceptualization uh, of, of Jesus, that is Jesus and the Disinherited um, by, by Thurman. And then um, the politics of Jesus, which is by Aubrey Hendricks. And so two great books, um, it, 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 you know, and then again, it, it moves us beyond that conversation. You know, we use, you know, it says in the book that he, he's, you know, hair of wool and feet of bronze. He's, so, okay, he's a person of color. Now what? Okay, so how did he negotiate life as a second class citizen? But see, people that operate from that premise, just to point that out, just want to prove the status quo wrong instead of acting on it. These are that's, all things yes, that and, need and, to be acted on. And, and uh, I want to add a third you. book to that, Doc, and that is Your Pastor Has Failed You, The Truth About Israel by Dr. Linda C. Wright. Dr. Yeah. Linda C. Wright. That's a very short, it's, it's a relatively short book but it is powerful. And so, so and to, you know, to your point, right, it's not enough, you know, like literally we're at a point where we're just stating the obvious and, and, and we're not acting upon it. So when we say Jesus was a person of color, okay, now what? When we say we build the pyramids, okay, now what? When we say that we, you know, we would, we was doctors, lawyers, and that, okay, now what? 
So how how do you utilize that now? How how do you access the high culture to benefit you today? Because that's 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 where we are right now. We're we we in 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 the steps of problem solving, we like at number one, identify the problem. Like we haven't started to generate options. We, uh, we are at identify the problem. I, I, I can't tell you how infuriating it is for um, to deal with people that do nothing but um, but broadcast the problem. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I agree with Pat Riley about bad teams define the problem a thousand ways. Good teams solve problems. Mm -hmm. And so we we are we are at identifying the problem. White supremacy is a problem. Yeah. Okay, so what are our options, right? And so we have to move into that space where we identify options and then we pick options um, and then we move on. Um, I um, think I told you that the most impactful things for me on my trip abroad were the Nile and the Al Colonel Mountains. And, and I think I'm pretty clear on why that is so and that is, is that they can't be taken. All the rest of that that was created, the Arabs used to fund their lifestyle. They run a thriving, <laughs> uh, you know, tourist and recreational enterprise in Egypt predicated on our high culture, right? So whatever it is we created has been taken. And we can go see it and we can marvel at it. And it's worth doing. But literally, this somebody else's now. That, that that is so powerful in a number of ways. Number one, if in fact, you know, you're running around here worshiping any structure and not um not making things better for people, it's a problem. And so, but, and that's kind of where we are. It's like, so, yep, we built all of this and I think we need to go look at it and see it. So how do we replicate that, right? What is awesome to me is that the, the denial yields today what it ever yielded. It is still the source. And that's why it is so, it is just so impactful to have spent three days on the Nile. Is because the Nile does today what it's ever done, and that is that is the nat that is the essence of you know the natural powers that exist, you know, yeah. in creation, right? And so, Al Carnal Mountain, same thing. They just they they are, and they they cannot be disturbed, right? They could be corrupted, but they can't be you know they you can't take them, right? And so. That that is that is just an awesome thing. And so we got to get to that space again, where we're not just stating the obvious. You know, they're not teaching us. Okay, well, why do we keep expecting that they're gonna teach us? So why don't we make use of these other resources that we have in order for our kids to to learn what they need to learn? You know, uh, but again, we'll state the obvious. We'll be like, all oh, the Asians, they got Saturday school. Okay. So then why we ain't got Saturday school? We got Sunday school. So why don't we use Sunday school different? Right. So mm -hmm. I know you all do some, you know, some uh, kind of innovative things in the context of, you know, of your church, your church family. Y'all got, y'all got, how many gardens y'all got? Y'all got at least one garden. I'm sure y'all got several uh, gardens. Several you know, gardens. So y'all got gardens. Y'all do seven uh, classes during the week. Yes. And so, so we have we have these spaces where we could do what it is that we say we need to do. We just need more people doing those things, those innovative things in those spaces. And the, if we continue to do those things, that will help us to withstand the onslaught. And Gerald does an incredible job. I I see from the outside, looking over his shoulder, of merging the gap between family. That's where, I mean, the family is the first institution. And that's the institution that, you know, the, the history that we can delve into with our family, 
families is you know the the good, bad, or indifferent. That's the foundation for all of this. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. and it all matters. And so again, it's like you know, so so it's great to know all of this other stuff, right? Um, but there's something more proximal to you that you need to know, right? So you need to know that family history also. And you need to know that family history in the context of the broader history. So like, what was your family doing when this happened? What was your family doing when that happened, right? And so many of us, we don't know these things, you know? So, uh, so again, like, you know, when we talk about St. Louis and we talk about, when we talk, you know, folks ain't really focused on East St. Louis. Folks, if they're thinking about, you know, that kind of trauma and that forced displacement, they are probably thinking about Tulsa. They're not thinking about East St. Louis. They're not thinking about Pierce City, Missouri. They're not thinking about Springfield, Missouri. They're not thinking about Joplin. They're not thinking about that. When they think about lynching, they don't think about Maryville, <laughs> right? They, you know, they don't think about that stuff happening in St. Louis. They don't know that today, and like on this date in, in 1948, we, we referenced this the last time we were all together. On this date in 1948, they were initiating the boycotts and the sit-ins at Sticks Baron Fuller. You know, so this isn't stuff that happened there. It happened in St. Louis too, that we were fighting the power in St. Louis, but we don't we don't think of it that way. And some of it is you know, some people don't know. Some of it is it's relatively uncomfortable, but we have to change it. And we got to, you know, we we have to learn it. We got to speak it. We got to teach it. We got to share it. You know, we got to continue to have these kind of formations. Uh, I mean, these kind of conversations, excuse me, and, and share it and have people, you know, do their own deep dives. Right. Because that's that's what's necessary. Many of us have landed here in St. Louis as a result of being displaced from the South on our way to Chicago, got a job and stayed here. Yes. So, or, 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 so like, so going there and, 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 and even maybe before then, folks who left uh, Mississippi, the exodusters who were going to Kansas. That's correct. You know, they, they came up here, they came up to St. Louis. Some of them went on to Kansas. Some of them stayed here, displaced. Like, but like we don't think of the great migrations as displacement. As displacement. All of those people weren't, you know, some of those people were fleeing. That's correct. Right. And so we have to we have to start to look at these things in such a way. And and we and we have these things going on in cities every day. We don't think about it when we, you know. When we get, when you're sitting in your home and you see that there's tornadoes all over the place, you're not really thinking about displacement. And when we're talking about natural disasters in particular, the people who are most vulnerable in the wake of a natural disaster are the people who were more vulnerable before the natural disaster occurred, right? So our vulnerable populations are more vulnerable in the midst of a natural disaster. What are we doing? Like, who, who cares about those people who live along the, the riverfront other than that they think it's a bad look for tourists who come in to, to go to games at the stadiums? Nobody cares about those people when it's cold. Nobody cares about those people when the Mississippi River rises. The Mississippi River, the rising of the Mississippi is an existential threat for those people, <laughs> right? Nobody cares when it's 100 degrees for those people. I'm sure St. Louis is the same as Chicago. Contrary to popular belief, more people die in Chicago because of heat-related death than they do because of the cold. I'm sure, I'm sure that St. Louis is the same way. So who's thinking about those vulnerable populations? And so these these are just the ways that we have to start to reshape the way that we think and the way that we, we experience these things because the patterns exist. And so the issue is, can we look at the patterns? This is pattern recognition. This is one of the um, intellectual skills that I measure when I'm doing psychological testing, pattern recognition. So can we look at these, these things 
in our environments, our present environment, or, or can we view in a historical context and garner life lessons that help us to literally survive? And then once we get survival taken care of, then we can start to thrive, right? And so that's that's how we got to be working. That's how we got to be moving. But it really it really requires that we engage the information because the information is there, and you know we got to move on beyond they not teaching us because that's not what enemies do. On that note. Need to read this uh, history like Rondo Red film. Let it be known that I am him. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Alexander, that was incredible. Thank you so much. Gerald Christmas, Attorney Gerald Christmas, you always do your thing, and it's a pleasure to see you at all thank times. You, sir. Thank, um, thank you, guys. Happy holidays, and if it's the Lord's will, we look forward to getting together again next week.